Hey everybody, welcome back to Mentor Minutes. We do have a name now for this podcast series, I guess you might call it that. Yep. Uh, so again, I'm Jared and I'm with Jay. Hey, nice uh, to be back. Yeah, thanks for coming back. Uh, today we thought we might just chat a little bit about uh, sort of underrated games. Um, so we each came up with our own top 10 underrated games um, and I'm not sure, I, we haven't talked about it yet, um, you know, it's, I don't know what his list looks mm -hmm. like, um, but I thought maybe we should explain a little bit about how we came up with our list yep. without mm -hmm. going over the names just yet. Sure. So uh, how, what was, uh, what guided you into making this list? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I've, I've played a lot of games, but, you know, I've only been in the hobby for four years, yeah. so I kind of looked at this as, um, you know, the list of underrated games that I have in my own collection that I don't hear a lot of people talk about, you know, online or uh, on other YouTube videos and things like that. And uh, sometimes um, when I play them with friends, it's like the first time they've ever even heard of them. So, mm -hmm. and then I also tried to sort of um, pick games that that cross different genres, you know, different player counts, things like that, to to give sort of a variety to the list. Yeah. Um, and mine really aren't in any particular order. Maybe the first one is my number one, uh, but the rest are just sort of a hodgepodge. So not. Uh, not ordered by anything other than just, you know, whichever one came yeah. to mind first. Now, is your list made up of games that you own? All these games are games that I own. Okay. Yep. Mine is too. Um, I just, I already have like an Excel list of, of all the games that I have. So I just kind of went through that and made a list. So I'm working with somewhere between 215 or so yeah. in my list. Yeah, I was, I was looking at uh, similar accounts. My list is a little out of date. <laughs> but... Um, there was also, uh, you know, I thought um, I might struggle to find 10, but uh, there was probably closer to maybe 15 um, that I really considered. Yeah, and then I, I just sort um, of whittled it down. I also had some extras, and I did write them down as honorable mentions. Yeah, so I've, got, I've got one honorable mention <laughs> in it, too. Maybe yeah. we'll cover that uh, uh, in a little bit. Sounds good. So how did you come up with your list? Yeah, uh, well, obviously, it's games that I own, uh, games that I've played. Um, and from there, it was games that I knew were really good, but in general, either aren't well known mm -hmm. or don't have a lot of um, popular reviews on BGG or okay. a very, you know, high number on BGG as far as the ranking. Okay. Um, okay. So it's, you know, it's like in the thousands instead of in the top four or five hundred. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think if some of mine on the list are in that same boat. But I think others are um, maybe rated a little higher. They're just not as popular. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, that's just sort of the general, you know, approach that I took. I mean, you might look it up and it might be four or five hundred, but yeah. it's still something that it's like, okay, but generally, how's this game perceived? And you know, does it does it really merit the uh, the negativity? Is sort of how I approach this. Okay. Cool. As well. So who's gonna go first? Um, what do you think? How are we gonna do this? So I think we should roll the dice. You think so? I think so. All right. Well. Uh, Good thing over here, we've got the Camel Up Pyramid. We played uh, Camel Up, we put uh, two dice in here. Do a little shake. Okay, so yellow, that's that's what I play. So you always play yellow. He plays yellow, there's the yellow two. Yep. So two. And I'm rolling a three. Okay, so it looks All like right. you're up. So I'll go first. First, the start of this list, we'll start with, of course, number 10. All right, so my number 10 is Lunch Money slash Beer Money. Beer Money is actually sort of a revision, reprint of Lunch Money. Lunch Money is kind of, a, it's, it's a card game, right? And you are attacking other uh, players at your table. And you have a hand of cards where you can play kicks and uppercuts and punches. Um, and it has a number on the card, which is how much damage that you will do to the player that you target. Now the player who, you know, gets hit uh, has to play a defensive card, like a block or a dodge. And um, if they do, they can block it. And then there's their, uh, what makes it really interesting is the combos that are possible. Like you, if someone blocks, you can then grab them. And unless they have like a freedom card, then they're grabbed, in which case <laughs> you can throw extra cards on top. Uh, for additional damage. So this is like a bunch of bullies fighting over some kids' lunch money? Or... I think that's the case. You're, <laughs> okay. you're fighting ki uh, kids like on the, the recess yard and <laughs> just, just to get lunch, okay. Beaten up for their lunch money. So it's, it's, it's a brutal game when it comes to your imagination <laughs> because you're like, I'm gonna uppercut you twice and then I'm gonna roundhouse kick you. And of course, if, if it's like a roundhouse kick and they dodge, the roundhouse kick goes to the next player and now uh, they have okay. to block it. 
So it's not just a two player game. You can oh yeah, play. Okay. and we we played it with like five players at a time. But it's um it's not very well rated, and I think part of that is it's a little more unknown. It's a little older. Uh, but also, there's not a lot of text um, in the game or on the cards that sort of help you play it. Um, I don't know if Beer Money added that, but it would certainly help. And so there's a lot of uh, memorization on what the cards uh, do because they're special abilities and stuff. Um, but yeah, definitely a great game uh, if you want to play something fun hmm. and kind of kind of silly. Uh, yeah, add lunch money to your collection. So it's like it a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, my number 10 is Nyet, uh, that's N-Y-E-T with an exclamation mark, um, and it's a trick-taking game, um, and uh, I really love, love a lot of card games, um, especially trick-taking games where, um, you know, you're trying to win uh, a ra you know, multiple rounds with different uh, win, win conditions. Um, what I really like about this game is, uh, let's see, this is, uh, it's like 1456 on BGG, so mm -hmm. it's pretty pretty low rank. Um, but it plays really great with four players. And the cool thing about it is every round before you start the round, um, you're choosing um, with these little tokens, like which things to cover up. So for example, if you want um, want to make sure that it, after you look at your hands, that Trump is a certain um, color, or uh, then you can cover up some of the other colors, but then everybody else has a chance to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you can decide who goes first, you can decide things like, um, you know, which is Trump or which is super Trump. Uh, and you can also um, pick partners as well. So um, every round, it, it sort of uh, varies in what the gameplay is, but you're all kind of selectively choosing the round conditions. And um, it's got great artwork. Um, and it's um, uh, Stefan Dora, who was the designer who also did a really popular game for sale which is a great bidding game. Oh, but uh, yeah, but Nyet is one of those ones that I don't see a lot of people playing, but it's one of the best uh, four-player trick-taking games that I've played. So uh, so that's my number 10. Awesome. I haven't played that one yet. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Sorry. And the art is really cool, too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're bad, starting with the puns. Starting puns. early with the puns. Okay. All right. <laughs> Moving on to number nine. Let's oh. go ahead and re-roll to see who's going to be the next to uh, share. All right, we're going to, we'll, we'll just, instead of using the pyramid, we'll just each roll. Okay. Okay. All right. Oh, there we go. Guess. Okay, here we go. All right, we're just going to roll. Okay, three. Okay. I got a three. I roll a turn. one, so he's going first. Okay. Right, number nine. So, um, number nine is uh, Rec Raiders. Um, and uh, this game actually came out in 2019, so it's not a very um, old game. Um, it's like 1987 on, on uh, BGG, so it's pretty low rated. Um, but this is a really cool game. Um, uh, the publisher is Kids Table Board Games. Mm. And um, the, it's, a, it's a family weight game. And the way that it works is you actually use like the box lid mm. as a dice tray. Mm -hmm. And you roll a bunch of dice. And then um, the dice have different faces, but also on the, the bottom of the board, there's these different squares. And so if dice land in these squares... Then you take them and you put them on this other board based on where they land and what the rank is. Mm -hmm. And then it's everybody gets this sort of dice drafting phase where they can pick dice. Uh, and then based on that, they send divers down to these different rec sites mm -hmm. to recover different uh, treasures and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's got some uh, cool dice drafting. It's got some great sort of set collection with the treasures. Um, there's a few other side things going on where you're uh, you can build aquariums and get points for making them uh, you know a certain height and things like that. Um, and the components are really cool. I mean the little diver meeples, uh, the artwork's great. Um, so really really good family game that um, came out on Kickstarter and I just haven't heard anything since then. Uh, but we really like it a lot. So awesome. Rec Raiders my number nine. So for me, um, I was actually introduced to this game this year. Uh, and I believe it came out last year. It's called Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade. Mm -hmm. um, it, so whenever I approach an IP-themed, you know, game where it's based on something, you know, super popular like Cowboy Bebop, uh, and that's one of the few animes that I do like, um, I'm always a little weary on how it's going to play. But mm -hmm. I was really surprised at how tight of a deck-building game this mm -hmm. is. Um, the, first of all, the artwork is fantastic. Uh, the uh, the theme is there. I mean, they've got the the cardboard for your your uh, the spaceship, the bebop. Mm -hmm. 
you've got um, boards for the different planets that you can travel to, which is a huge part of the show. And overall, you're working together to sort of capture criminals and defeat uh, Vicious, the final bad guy. But, of course, you know, they're competing to be the best at, uh, you know, at fighting and capturing criminals. Um, but it's very intuitive. There's a lot of um, color coding that really helps um, players to sort of see what combos happen when you get a certain card. Um, and it's, you know, I always like deck building games when it's not the primary mechanic. Mm -hmm. And this one just does a really good job of fusing, you know, the deck building aspect of like moving your, your miniature uh, to various places to do actions and to fight and that sort of thing. So oh. it's a lot of fun. I actually did a tutorial video on it. So if you're interested to check that out, yep. stay on the channel and uh, click on the learn to play for that. And I think I think you guys are going to like it. Yeah, I, I love uh, deck builders that put a little spin on it, especially mm -hmm. when you've got something else going on besides just the hand of cards. Yeah. Uh, so that seems cool. Does it use artwork that's um, sort of just still images from the show, or is it kind of all brand new artwork? Or Well, I mean, it's it's certainly artwork that looks like the show. I don't know if they hired the same okay. artists yeah. or if they pulled them from you know episodes, but it doesn't look um, like an, another artist's interpretation. Right. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. Awesome. Uh, oh, we got to roll again. Yeah, so <laughs> for number eight, we're going to roll and see who's going to share first. Okay, so... Uh, I got my green die. I got a three again. I got a three. I guess okay. we re-roll. Oh, wait. Threes again. Two threes, <laughs> two threes in a row. I got a three okay, again. I got a one. Three threes in a row. That's, That's awesome. You. And these are the camel up dice, so three is the highest. <laughs> All right, so my number eight is Robo Rally. Now, some of you who, who have played this will know that this game is amazing and it, it rocks. Like, it's just a blast and it's also very, like, thinky and you have to plan ahead your moves. Um, it's just, at this point, I would say it's underrated because it's so old and it's had so many versions that have come out mm -hmm. since its original printing. Um, and each printing actually has, I think, some benefits about, you know, how they printed it. Like, the first one had, like, metal uh, miniatures. Um, the second one had um, like just a lot of uh, new game mechanics on the boards, but the the new edition has a new damage way to to deal with damage, and mm -hmm. so I I feel like there's none that you can really go wrong with, um, whichever version you use. But it's such a good um, programming game. So if you are looking for like crazy hectic. Uh, chaos with multiple players up to eight players can play this game oh i didn't realize it went that high in the absolutely now i think um, the newest printing might be hmm. down to six okay. um but the first two uh, versions were up to eight players and basically everyone programs their cards at the same time and then one at a time uh, or like you know one phase at a time is what they call it uh, everyone executes their command line right and mm -hmm. sometimes you end up pushing other robots or shooting lasers at them but the board itself has like gears that rotate you and, okay. and uh, conveyor belts that move you so you don't always know where you're going to end up at the end of your five card program because you can't change it right right um so it's always hectic and crazy and it's a lot of fun um, so check Robo Rally out. That's by Richard Garfield. Yeah, I, I really, um, I've only played this once, but I played like just half of a game mm -hmm. and I really liked it. But you, you know, it's, um, some of the other people at the table, they weren't real familiar with sort of that programming element. Mm -hmm. So they didn't, they weren't, they were expecting everything they planned to go perfectly. <laughs> and I think does. you just have to put your, your <laughs> mind, mindset has to be that you know you're here you're not going to succeed but yeah. you're just going to have a good time right? sure and i guess i didn't mention it's a race i mean you're trying to get to certain checkpoints right. around the board right, right, right. um and so whoever gets to all the checkpoints in order first will win um, but the more players means the more robots and there's only a certain number of spaces that you can be on the board so yeah. that's where there's a lot more chaos that happens um with running, higher running into counts. each other yeah everything. very cool so. very cool yeah i definitely have to play that one again uh let's see my number eight is a racing game um, and it's called Snow Tales. Um, and uh, I'm a big fan of racing games. Um, I probably own about 10 different ones. Um, you know, Downforce is one of the really popular ones, Flamme Rouge, you know, Formula D. So I've, I've got all those games, but um, what I really like about Snow Tales is it's actually like Siberian Husky sled racing. Mm. Um, and the cool thing about it is uh, you're racing, um, you put together the, a modular track and you have your sled. Um, but the, the, the neat thing is you have this hand of cards 
and the cards are all dog cards mm -hmm. and they have different numbers on them mm -hmm. and you always play three cards one for the the, the dog that's pulling the right side of the sled uh -huh. one that's pulling the left side of the sled and then one for your break okay. and the neat thing is that if you put like say a four on the right dog and a three on the left dog then the right dog's stronger Mm -hmm. So that's how you'll you'll be able to move from right to left. Mm -hmm. And so the difference between those numbers are how many spaces you can move on the track right or left. Mm -hmm. So steering is kind of neat. Um, that sounds pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, you have to be careful that you're not going to turn too fast and crashing. Um, but <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, and it's what I like about it is it's not just car racing. Um, mm -hmm. It's a neat theme. Um, and um, this one came out in like 2008. And I don't see anybody playing this one any anymore. Yeah. So um, yeah. Snow Tales is my number eight. It's a great game. Nice. Moving on to number seven. We're going to roll again and see who goes first. I rolled a one. He rolled a one. one. We'll try again. Three. Two. All you right. got it. I'm going to go first on number seven. All right, so this is also a brand new game, and unfortunately, if uh, you're looking for it, you're gonna have to back it on Kickstarter again, because this is a Kickstarter game called Philosophia Dare to be Wise. Huh. It's fantastic. I mean, now, my my personal bias is that I studied philosophy in college. Okay. So as a philosophy major, and especially Greek philosophy, that's what this is all about. So the board is a map of Greece, and you play as a philosopher, and you've got a little um, marble-looking bust of the philosopher that you can move around the board. You can go anywhere you want that's empty, and uh, you take various actions to, uh, you know, tutor and gain money, uh, spend money to build uh, or to hire workers, use workers to build schools, uh, uh, schools of your own, you know, thought, and then you can have students, and uh, you try to gain students all over the map. Um, and essentially you're doing a lot of different things and all of them are ways that help you win because you're trying to basically score three what they call labyrinth tokens. And so any number of things can sort of lead you to gain a token. Um, and then from there you kind of move the timeline along. Um, and then if there, if there's a, uh, tie for whoever has three tokens at the end of the game, then all tied players will engage in a final debate. Okay. So there is actually a debate mechanism in the game that you can do before the end of the game as well. Um, but the final debate's always fun because it involves everybody who thought they were going to try to win. Um, and so you use cards like syllogisms and sophistry cards to sort of play against each other. And um, hmm. it's color coded, so it's more like a um, uh, like a rock paper scissors type of mechanic. So you don't have to really know what the cards mean or what they do as long as you know like the type of card whether it's a sophistry or syllogism and then the uh the color um you know and symbol on it and what it's going to be is shown right on there so for people who don't really like you know yeah. violent fighting games absolutely you can have this awesome debate at the end <laughs> oh yeah it's so cool <laughs> so, yeah i've not heard of this one yeah it's great and like i said you have to go in on a, on a kickstarter from the company today as of uh, september 1st the uh the company cogito ergo meeple uh is also running a new campaign for their kickstarter uh in the philosophia um sort of realm right and it's also called philosophia but it's a uh, floating world it's a completely different game but it's based on japanese philosophy um and i'm very excited to check that out but if i believe if you get on a kickstarter you'll, you'll be able to grab a copy of uh philosophia dare to be wise so if that sounds interesting to you yeah. i highly recommend it yeah and unique theme too absolutely neat um, okay, my number seven is um, a pretty new game, 2018. It's called Tales of Glory. Um, and this one is by Ankama Games. Um, this is a tile laying game where um, what you're doing is you're putting tiles next to each other to trigger events to ultimately get points um, to, to win based on these combinations you're making. Mm -hmm. um, and the tiles have you know, heroes on them or monsters or quests. Um, and the neat thing is like the edge of the tiles all have different symbols. So if you can get like a key to match up with a chest, then anywhere else you, on, on this sort of tableau that you're building where you have a treasure chest that's not open, you can then take a treasure and you can get the benefit from that. Mm -hmm. And it has things you can spend like magic and other things. Um, what's cool about the game is um, it's a really fast tile placement game. It's got awesome artwork, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it's uh, super popular because... 
Um, on BGG, I was reading that they had this uh, big issue with the, a misprint when mm. it first came out. So I think they had to take a lot of their supply and redo it. Uh -huh. And so I don't know if that financially like impacted the company. Um, but there's a few other re reviewers that have kind of uh, pointed this one out before. Um, and um, But I've not seen anybody else playing it. And it's called Tales of Glory. Uh, that's my number seven. All right, let's look at number six. So we're going to roll and see who's going to share first. Three is again. Both got a three. I'm going to try again. Uh, both got a three. Next time we're going to use a D12. I know, right? <laughs> oh, one my ones again. Oh, ones. Awesome. All right, here okay, we go. I got a three, you got, you got a, two. a two. All right, so my number six is named Egizia Shifting Sands. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, this is one but this on my list. Oh, absolutely. It's yep. such a good worker placement game that you don't expect to be mm -hmm. as deep as it is. Um, one of the one of the ways that it plays that's very unique is you have to play from the top down on the Nile River. And it's of course mm -hmm. an Egypt theme. Um, and throughout the game you're doing actions that uh, boost your the power of your crew or the people that can work on different buildings and uh, collecting cards that help you again build on the board. But there's three main building zones that you're trying to build at, which can be blocked by opponents. So um, you have to be able to choose, um, first of all, from the top down, which actions you want to take, because you're, you're, the next worker you place has to be further down on the Nile. Mm -hmm. So if you jump ahead and make sure that you get a building spot so that you can build, you're going to miss out on potentially some other good bonuses or cards that could help you in the game. Uh, and because of this, the strategy is very tight and it's very competitive over those spots. It doesn't play very long, and that's where I, I think it just it shines as a great medium weight worker placement game with a lot of strategy that's not that difficult to teach. So if you're looking for something like that for um, maybe either introducing a, a worker placement game past their gateway level, mm -hmm. this is a good one to turn to um, because it does add so much depth without extra complicated rules yeah I, so i almost put this on my list but i'd only played it the one time ah, yeah. and um what i loved about the game was as you said it was it's very easy to take your turn like the 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 actions that you're taking are, are very simple but especially as the game gets on like mm -hmm. all the different things that you're thinking about and the way that you're deciding okay do i work on this monument or do i do the set collection element um, it just gives you a lot of really, you know, good decisions for yeah. what's what's really a family weight style game, I think. Absolutely. Um, and one other thing I really loved about this game was um, the artwork. Real, uh, you know, unlike a lot of games where the board has you know designated spaces to put like different things, um, the cool thing with this board is the artwork is really great at uh, letting letting you put your ships and your different tokens on the artwork itself. Mm -hmm. Instead of having these sort of, you know, just just designated uh, places, yeah. so it it just fits perfectly. Um, it's I also feel like it's a euro that tries not to be a euro. Yeah, yeah, it's if it's that makes sense. really pretty, and it's dual sided too. Um, yeah, we played it two players. So there's a the other side would be for three or four players. Yes, yeah. um, but you know, and it's it's very flexible. You yeah, know, in how it works. Yeah, I'd like to get this to the table again. Awesome, good pick. Thanks. Um, okay, my number six is a two player only game. And this is called uh, Sherlock, Holmes, and Mycroft. Um, this one's by Devere Games. Okay. And um, it's uh, 1479 on uh, Board Game Geek, as far as the rating. Um, but the neat thing about this game is you're, you're taking, I think it's seven days um, in London, and both uh, you, or if you're playing Sherlock, or your brother Mycroft, are two geniuses mm. that are trying to basically solve this crime. And the goal is to get more clues, essentially, uh, than the other uh, player, uh, which essentially gives you more evidence. Mm -hmm. And then if you have more evidence than the other player, you win at the end of the game. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also a work replacement game. And um, the way it works is you have different slots uh, for each day of the week. So the first day of the week, you have like three slots open, and they're all different witnesses. Mm -hmm. and, and what you do is, so if you put your little meeple on one of the witnesses, it gives you a special ability, like you can get more clues or you can, um, you know, get, get more um, tokens or goods. There's also like a set collection element. Mm. Um, but then that day, you can't use that space again. 
And so until you've placed all three of your workers and it goes on the next day, you've locked those spaces mm -hmm. and then you stand them back up. But then that eliminates choices for the day two. Mm -hmm. And then you get an extra action day two. So as, as you progress through these seven days, your early turns are real simple. And then on turn seven, you know, you're really crunching trying to make those decisions. So great little two player game, uh, Holmes, Sherlock and Mycroft by number six. Sounds awesome. All right, we're moving on to number five. Let's do a quick roll and see who's gonna do it first. Oh, that'll be two. Jay. I roll a one. Okay. Okay. So my number five is a um, a game that was recently kickstarted. It's called Animal Kingdoms, mm. and uh, this is an area control based game for um, two to five players, uh, and um, also family weight game. Um, what I like about this one is. Um, you have a board where each of the spaces, I think there's five different spaces, represents um, essentially a track where you're trying to um, put your tokens to, to, get, to gain area. So it's really mm -hmm. area control, uh, but you also have a hand of cards. Um, and uh, it's a very, um, every play is really unique and variable because these tokens come out on each of the spaces and they dictate sort of what cards you have to have mm -hmm. in order to place one of your workers there or one of your um, uh, characters. Animals there. or something. Yeah. So like, for example, you might have one that says, okay, you can only put odd cards there. Or another one might say, um, you can only place an animal here or a, a kingdom here as long as it doesn't match one of the ones to the left and right of it. So it's sort of puzzly as you're drawing cards, trying to figure out where you can play. And then also um, there's this process where if you take up the very last space, um, that's good because you can slot into a position for the next rounds where you kind of start with one or a token already there. Mm -hmm. um, but if you do that, you're out of that round. So it's a really cool sort of um, uh, push and pull where you're trying to do more, but you're also trying to time your moves so that you're not uh, out of the round too long so that the other players take advantage of you um, but you're still getting um, control of the areas that you need to you know when you when you want to and it's plays quick three rounds um, really really great artwork on the cards um, the cards were a little bit thin in the kickstarter version so i believe they're reissuing like those because now they've got a dice version of this game that's mm -hmm. on kickstarter i think it's now uh, cool. too but um, really really cool little area control game um, that's uh, great for families that's Animal Kingdoms, my number five. So my number five is called Cytosis, a cell biology board game. This, yeah. Have you played it? I've heard of it. They, okay. they, they've got a series of these types yeah. of games. Yeah. So uh, this is, I can't remember the publisher's publisher, name, yeah. um, but certainly these guys uh, make very cool, very fun science-based mm. board games. And Cytosis, I think, is their best. It's about a molecular cell and how it works. And so you have to place workers to, uh, you know, collect mRNA and then the uh, move it onto the nucleo nucleus, and then you collect glucose, and then you spend all these sort of things that the cell would then like make. And the cards that you can collect that um, that's what you're trying to complete. Uh, the cards will mm -hmm. say like this kind of hormone, and it needs this and this and that. And so you use your workers to take actions to be able to synthesize this stuff. Hmm. Um, and one of the interesting parts is um, whenever you take certain actions um, on those more complicated, you know, types of cards, you actually start here in one area and then you move it down uh, in another action and then you move it to like a third spot for the final action to complete it. Hmm. And so it's like these a lot of these cards have to be done over a series of steps. Uh, but the artwork is great. The science is solid. There's actually a, a like an appendix book that's just huh. explaining the science of what's going on. Um, so it's all very accurate uh, representation, but it doesn't overwhelm you with the science uh, because you can you can play it without mm. you know having to worry too much about what actually is happening. But it's on um, you know that being said, if you're a science teacher and you're looking for a fun way to engage students uh, about how the cell's working this is a great game to play. Yeah. Um, and so mm -hmm. I think maybe the science theme has turned off some people, um, mm -hmm. but it's a very solid medium weight, you know, worker placement game. Hmm. Cool. So I've heard of that one. Moving on now to pick number four. Number four. We're going to roll dice again. Okay. Three. I rolled a two. He's going first. Okay. So my number four is medieval Academy. 
Um, this is a, uh, a great little um, card drafting game uh, where uh, you're uh, drafting cards at the beginning, uh, very similar to like a Sushi Go or something like that. Mm -hmm. But then you're using the cards uh, to move up on these tracks on different boards uh, to try to get the most points at the end of the game. Um, it's got a sort of King Arthur theme, um, cool artwork. Um, but uh, what I like about it is um, it's really similar to a game that Richard Garfield designed called Treasure Hunter. Mm. And uh, in Treasure Hunter, you're trying to basically get either the minimum or maximum values to win these different treasures. Well, in this game, you're in some cases, you're trying to uh, get just enough ahead of somebody else so that you're not paying like a penalty mm. or you're trying to get further around a track by the end of the game than everyone else. But halfway or a third of the way through the game, all the tracks reset. So you have so it's it's one of those where if, if there's somebody that's kind of taking a runaway lead, mm -hmm. it sort of evens the playing field again a third of the way through the game. It's a nice catch up mechanism. Yeah, it's, and and um, uh, it does that again uh, about I think uh, on um, maybe three fourths of the way through the game or something like that as well. Um, whereas a couple tracks just kind of continue for the whole game. Mm -hmm. So um, neat little card drafting game. Um, I'd love to see a reprint of this one because um, even though it's a game by Yellow. The components really aren't that great, mm -hmm. surprisingly. Um, but um, yeah, if you haven't played it before, Medieval Academy, it's my number four. Check it out. Sounds fun. I have not played that one yet. So yeah, do you yeah. have this? I do have this one. That's awesome. Yeah, play. It's it's not the best with two players because of the competition. Mm -hmm. But anything three to five is is really fantastic. Awesome. My number four is a game called Commissioned, which is a uh, Shara Games uh, game, and it is kind of like a reverse Pandemic. Uh, you've got a old Roman style uh, map of the Middle East, not Middle East, but the Mediterranean. All right, so it's everything around the Mediterranean, but the map is made as authentically as what it would have been when you at know the at the time. Mm. Um, this is based on the uh, the travels of Paul and and New in the New Testament, as well as uh, some of the other apostles in the Bible. And so players will take on the role as one of these apostles. And collectively, uh, you're, it's a co-op. You're trying to basically grow the church at the time by moving to different cities and planting churches, which are represented with white cubes. Uh, there's also um, challenge cards that sort of happen. Uh, they're, I believe they're called the faith cards. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like a testing of your faith. Um, and it affects uh, the board uh, in a negative way, and you have to address those uh, cooperatively. Um, so one of the things I really like about this um, as a co-op game is, and I've never seen it done as well as it does here, is it, it mitigates the whole uh, quarterbacking problem with a lot of co-op games of yeah. one player sort of knowing what needs to be done and just sort of directing Don't people to do it. Do, yeah. But this takes that and adds a dice roll mechanic where uh, if you roll a certain number, then you're not allowed, like no one at the table is allowed to talk. So huh. no one can help you if you're the first player and you're taking your turn. And uh, so there's there's that element that I think is a really huh. great addition that is a simple way to add into any co-op game, honestly. But yeah. uh, it's infused into how this works and it just um, allows for more of um, just player agency without relying mm -hmm. on one player. Yeah, this is one um, I've had on my wish list for a while because I'd, I'd heard uh, good things about it. And... Um, I've I've kind of played Pandemic to death at this point, um, but I love that system where yeah. instead of you know instead of trying to like remove cubes, you remove cubes, you're, you're trying to spread them. them. That's yeah. that's a neat that's a neat concept. Yeah. Very cool. Moving on to our number three pick, do a quick die roll. I got a two. You got, you got one. Okay. All right, I'm going to talk first. So number three, for me, I'm going to say Dinogenics. So if you're interested in a dinosaur theme park theme of a game, you have actually multiple options. And Dinogenics is a great one that I think is underrated. Now, most of you have played or heard of Dinosaur Island because it kind of, well, it came first. So it, it gained that first mover advantage. Mm -hmm. And that's what everyone was talking about. However, not long after that came out, Dinogenics had a, a very successful Kickstarter. And then a year later had another successful Kickstarter for an expansion. Now, this, this game is... I mean, they're very different in terms of how they play, the complexity, 
Um, but I keep both in my collection. And Dinogenics is great because it's a more of a medium weight complexity. Mm -hmm. So it's a little more accessible, especially for those who like the theme, but can't get into a really heavy, crunchy Euro like Dinosaur Island. Mm -hmm. uh, the artwork, I think, is a little more palatable. It doesn't have those harsh pinks and yeah. bright colors mm -hmm. of Dinosaur Island. This is more of a realistic artwork look uh, to the game. Um, and it's more streamlined. There's less phases to worry about. Um, but my favorite part of Dinogenics, I think, is the fact that you can build fences in your park and how you arrange the fences is going to determine if and when your dinosaurs will rampage. Uh, okay. There's a rampage dice if that happens, but I think part of the part of the fun I think with Dinogenics is being able to build out your park with those fences and trying to prevent you know the dinosaurs from escaping. But there is uh, there are cards in the game that are um, more of a take that element. You can use them, you can remove them if you don't want that in the game, um, but there is some player interaction in addition to it being a work replacement game and, and uh, restricting those number mm -hmm. of spaces. Um, so if you are a, a dinosaur fan, a Jurassic Park movie fa uh, fan, and you've played Dinosaur Island, or maybe you're looking for a game that's a little easier to understand uh, or easier to introduce to your friends, check out Dinogenics. It's really good. I'm definitely going to have to play this one because I, I do yeah. like Dinosaur Island, but um, uh, there's there's some parts of the Dinosaur Island where the the random kind of bag draws can really mess you up, mm -hmm. you know, and and can't ne they're not necessarily fair, <laughs> you know, to all the players. Um, but this is one I've been wanting to play for a while. That's neat. Okay, my number three is Gravwell. Um, the actual name is Gra Gravwell Escape from the Ninth Dimension. <laughs> wow, I've um, never even heard of yeah, this. Yeah, so um, you know, I, I love racing games, and this is. Um, it's, it's sort of a racing game, but it's also a uh, simultaneous card play game. Um, and the, the theme here is that you're all um, different spaceships that are trying to uh, fly away from this sort of black hole mm -hmm. and try to get away from it. Um, and you have these cards, and there's 26 cards, and they're, uh, they go along with the alphabet, you know, A to Z. Mm -hmm. But they represent essentially different sort of uh, chemical compounds, a lot of them are kind of made up things, that you're going to apply to your spaceship. Pseudoscience. Pseudoscience, yeah. It's a very sci-fi theme. Um, but some of the cards will um, give you propulsion, uh, and the cool thing is um, they have a number, and that's how many spaces you, you basically move away from the closest object you're to. Mm -hmm. So it uses gravity really in an interesting way, and that's what I like about the game, is the mechanics really cool. So if you play one of those high cards, um, what you can do is you can uh, repel against whatever ship is closest to you. So you hope that you're closest to a ship that's behind you, so you propel forward, mm. because the goal is to get to kind of to the end of the track before everybody else does. Because it's a race. Because it's a race. But then depending on the letter, the letter of the element, that's the turn order. And since you're playing simultaneously, similar to Robo Rally, mm -hmm. you may think what you're gonna do is going to get you, you know, 10 moves ahead, but then somebody plays a letter that's sooner and they end up leaping in front of you. And so your card actually pushes you backwards 10 spaces. Oops. So it's a really, really fun sort of thinky um, puzzle game. Um, not a lot of actions, but um, a lot of fun uh, in, in the gameplay. And this one's like 1,056 on BGG. So um, if you like thinky racing type games, grab well. Escape from the Ninth Dimensions, one to try out. My number three. All right, well, we are moving on to number two. We're going to do a quick roll and see who's going to share first. Oh, got a one? That doesn't count. Okay, no. roll again. No. Oh, two. Okay. You got a two. <clears throat> All right. What's your number two? So my number two um, is a large sort of party style um, one versus many type game, uh, and it's called Halapagos. Uh, and mm -hmm. this is a game, it plays, it can play up to 12 players. Um, That's awesome. And the theme is, it's kind of like uh, Survivor, where uh, you're all on this deserted island, and a typhoon is coming. And so by the end of the game, you have to be able to have built a raft and uh, gathered enough uh, water and food um, to make it uh, throughout multiple days being on this island but to also have enough of a supply so that if you do build the raft and the typhoon hits, um, you can get off the island and, and survive while you're out at sea. Yeah. And the neat thing about the game is 
you know, you're doing really simple actions. So it's not really, um, you know, there's not a lot of variety in the actions. You know, you're going fishing, you're gathering water, you're building the raft, you know, uh, you're, uh, you, but you can also um, swim out into the ocean where the, the boat has wrecked and, and then stranded you mm -hmm. and search for treasure. And those treasure can be things like guns and bullets, as well as like extra supplies of food. Nice. So the game starts out really cooperatively where everybody is like, okay, we're going to build rafts. We're going to you know, get food. We're going to survive. And at the end of the round, everybody has to pay enough food and water um, to stay on, on the uh, island. But if you're short of food or water, then you have to vote somebody off the island. Oh boy. And so that's where it starts to get cutthroat because then you can start playing cards like guns, but then people don't know if you have a bullet to go with it. Oh, man. And so it really, it really like devolves into a lot of bluffing, lots of bluffing, yeah. um, a lot of double back type stuff that happens, a lot of stealing cards. So it's definitely a, a take that kind of game. Um, but it's neat because just like the show Survivor, you know, really early on, these alliances start to form. And, you know, most of the game is kind of played above the table and mm -hmm. you're all in your friend's head. So mm -hmm. um, and they do have an expansion that came out just recently, too. But this one is one that I'd say if you like. Um, you know, games like big games like Resistance, Werewolf, that kind of stuff. I really think you'd like Galapagos. That's my number two. All right. My number two might be a little controversial, but I love this game also because I love the video game that it's based on. And this was one of my first, if not my first, uh, Kickstarter game that I backed. It's called Dark Souls, the board game. <clears throat> now, if you've mm -hmm. seen Dark Souls, the board game, or even heard about it, um, probably what you've heard is that the game's broken or like the rules are complicated or uh, it's difficult to uh, or, or that there's a grind to it all of those are all, all of those thoughts are valid but <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I've had some amazing experiences amazing games playing Dark Souls I feel like it's it's as much of D&D &D and Gloomhaven esque without the complication of like playing cards to do things um, and it's just, it captures the feeling of um, sort of constantly battling against the enemies in your area, just like the video game. Now, there are rules that make the game punishing that are just by default because the video game is so punishing. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you, if you do some revision, some very light revision to the rules, it becomes much more enjoyable for general gamers. Um, not just the hardcore, you know, gamers or even hardcore fans of the video game. Um, and so just some small adjustments. This game is amazing. The artwork, the uh, the miniatures that come with this game, the expansions that are available. It's all just so perfect in how it replicates the experience of the video game. So I, I got to say it is very underrated because it's such a great experience if you can find the right group of friends. Uh, it can play one to four, so you can do a solo campaign, uh, which, you know, I, I'll always do that. If I get bored and I'm looking for a fun solo game and I've got plenty of time, hmm. that's the one I'm going to play. Hmm. And uh, do you feel like it, somebody who has never even played the video game could, could jump into this one? Absolutely. I think, you know, a lot of things mm -hmm. uh, that attract people to want to play is how the miniatures look. Okay. They're like, wow, that boss looks really cool. Hmm. Let's try to play this and, hmm. and try to fight it together because it is a co-op. Um, and you don't. There's not a lot of story to the video game in the first place. I mean, there is. Okay, there's 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 lore, but as far as how it's presented in the game, it, it, you could go playing the whole game and not really understand what's going on. Right, right. So the the board game is very much just how it's presented. Um, it's very straightforward and how you you know progress and work together to try to basically take on, um, you know, arena at, by arena at a time full of random enemies that get, you know, populated by a card. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I recommend it if, you know, if you've got the money because it is expensive. If you like Dark Souls uh, or if you're looking for a very heavy and thematic uh, sort of dungeon crawly experience with amazing miniatures. Very cool. I haven't played this one yet, so yeah. you might have to teach me this one. Mm -hmm. So before we get to number one, I think we, we both mm -hmm. actually had a, a few extras that didn't quite make it to the list. So these are our honorable mentions. Um, for me, one of them was uh, Crusaders, Thy Will Be Done. Yeah. 
Um, I this one. It's a very good game. It just doesn't have as much replayability, I mm -hmm. think, as mm -hmm. it would need to really um, be appreciated. I think a good expansion would probably help it a lot, but it is a fun game and it does some really cool uh, things with the rondelle mechanics mm -hmm. and how you unlock uh, stronger actions uh, by building. So I, it is a strong game, um, but it, it does have some flaws. I get that. Uh, I will also add Cerebria to this list. I've heard of this one, yeah. It's, it's a great game, mm -hmm. but I understand the barrier to play it mm -hmm. because the rules can be very complicated mm -hmm. for a team uh, team on team game. Um, both sides have to really know the game to make it a competitive game. Whereas other games, if it's, com if it's very complicated, one player can sort of help everybody. But in this game, um, because it's, you know, one against one or two against two, you know, one side may have just a disadvantage on understanding what, what strategies are there. Mm -hmm. But once everyone's understood and played this game, it is a fantastic, fantastic uh, team uh, heavy game um, by Mind Clash Games. So check that out. It's, it's a theme on, you know, the emotions that you have in your mind. Uh, some people have called it like inside the, out. the inside <laughs> out of yeah. board games. Yeah. Um, it's just not quite as accessible as the movie. <laughs> right, right. So another one I have on my honorable mentions is Alchemists. Have you seen that one yet? Uh, yeah, this has an app to it, right? Like it an does. App as well. Yeah. So it has an Same app game. and also is, you know, it's got a board. It's a worker placement <laughs> game. Um, the artwork is great. Um, you know, it uses cards. It uses workers. Um, and the, the crux of this game is you're, you're using deductive logic and you are trying to formulate all these formulas um, by uh, scanning the cards combinations with the app and then it gives you uh, you know an answer or what kind of thing you've just made because of that and the deductive part of this game it's not as great for players who lose track of you know how to mark everything or how they're they're jotting down their notes because if you make one mistake on things that you've learned by playing you know and because it's just going to mess up everything for you and you're not going to have a good chance of winning. So if you um, if you understand how this works and you mark and keep it consistent, I mean, it's, it's, it's very much based on deductive logic. It's a lot of fun. I really like this game. Um, if I can get more people to play it. Yeah. Yeah. I have heard of this one. It was, I was a little intimidated because I knew it was a heavier game. And yeah. Had that deduction element, which I'm not the greatest at. Yep. Neat. You have another one. I, think. I have one last okay. one. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, it's, this is a hard list for me to yeah, make. I've got a good, I've got a comment on this one too. Okay, <laughs> so this last one, honorable mention, would be Godfather Corleone's Empire. If you haven't heard of it, it's a come on game, and mm. it is a fantastic medium mm. weight worker placement game. Uh, everyone gets into it very fast, even non gamers that I've shown this to. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of treat it as like a gateway game, honestly, because it's so accessible. Even though there's a lot of strategy and there's a lot, uh, there's really a lot going on here. Um, I think the most memorable thing is that you can like complete jobs that attack your opponent's workers and there thereby those uh, miniatures sit in the Hudson River yep. <laughs> as dead bodies for that for the rest of that round, which is really funny. Uh, and it always gets people uh, you know laughing or, or perhaps upset at you. Uh, but hey, that's that's the mafia life of New York, you know. Mm -hmm. What are you gonna do? The reason though it didn't make it my list is because it's not quite as underrated as uh, some of these others. I, I feel like it has a high enough rating in BGG that I think people know that it's decent, but it may not be as underrated as some of these others. Yeah, it, you know, if, had I thought of that, because uh, <laughs> we talked about this like a week ago, and yes. I, I can't believe I forgot to put it on my list, I would have put this on my list mm -hmm. uh, because. Um, it's, I mean, that is, it's an Eric Lang designed game, yep. you know, and, uh, and he's, you know, he's one of the hottest designers around. Um, it's got great production quality. It's got great minis. Um, all the different minis are like unique molds for the minis. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and like last Christmas, you could get a copy of this for like $15. It, um, I can't believe it. it, it it's it, amazing. It's, yeah. A great price. deal. And, um, and yeah, there is there is a lot of like take that, but it's I mean it's within the theme of the, the Godfather theme, mm -hmm. and um, I've gotten people to play this game that don't usually even play board games mm -hmm. because of the IP. Yep. And then once they discovered this is you know kind of this is an area control set collection game right. uh, with you know dudes on the map, um, it was it's a lot of fun. Um, a lot it's of a fun. good game to transition to other games. To yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's 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 a really good honorable mention. Um, so the one I had written down 
um, was uh, the game called Manhattan. And uh, the reason that um, I, it didn't make my list is because uh, Manhattan actually came out in 1994 and it won the Spiel des Jahres. Mm, <laughs> so yeah. uh, it was a Not really as as... yeah, it was a really popular game. Um, <laughs> but they it kind of disappeared as a lot of those winners back in the 90s did. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a new printing um, that came out in 2018. It's a really beautiful printing, and and the, the it's also area control where you have these kind of translucent uh, building pieces, mm -hmm. and you're building on different sort of districts in Manhattan. And it's very simple, um, so you can, you know, easy to play with the family, and you get points for like the most buildings in a specific district or the highest building, um, you know, those kinds of things. Um, but uh, great table presence, a really great air control game, and um, uh, one that uh, has kind of faded away, but uh, definitely worth picking up. Yeah. Do you have any other honorable mentions? No, nope, that was the only one I had. All right. <laughs> well, in that case, let's move on to our number one picks. Number one. I two. rolled a one, he rolled a two, he's going to go first. Okay. So my number one is a game called Path of Light and Shadow. Uh, this game came out in 2017. Um, it's a deck building uh, area control game. Um, actually, a lot of them are, that I, on my list have been area mm -hmm. control. Um, or but, racing. Or racing. Um, but uh, this is, instead of it being um, sort of area majority, where you're placing, you know, you have the most people, like the most figures in a specific area um, than somebody else. You really only have one figure, but each of the different areas that you're trying to conquer have um, a certain number of, of defense. And these are these really cool little plastic pieces that stack kind of like Legos. Um, so you may have one that has a defense of 14. So there's 14 little plastic pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have ones that are, you know, maybe a defense of seven. So... The cards are all du dual purpose, uh, so you can either use the cards for building, which let you move up to kind of these tech trees that increase your abilities throughout the game, mm. uh, or let you fight. Um, uh, but the neat thing is that although there's some um, sort of determinism around the cards that you play and how what your strength is going to be, you're also rolling dice as well, because when you do um, try to take over an area, you play cards, you roll dice, and the dice can supplement the area, but some of the dice have damage on them. And if you roll those, then even though you conquer the area, your defenses are broken down. So you remove some of those kind of Lego pieces. So now mm -hmm. it's easier to take over by the next person. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one of the uh, coolest parts about the game, uh, in addition to that, is that when you're building your deck, you're either going to go the mercy route or you're going to go a cruelty route. And one of them is better at building, one of them is better at fighting, and, mm -hmm. and you can win the game you know, either way, um, as far as points go. Um, but this game, it's the reason it's, um, I think it's underrated is it went, it went out of print because the designers, uh, split to work on, uh, different studios, but this game was by Jonathan Gilmore, who did Dead of Winter, Dinosaur Island, and Travis, uh, Chance and Nick Little, um, who've done like Western Legends and others. So these are, you know, big time designers, uh, that, um, you know, collaborated on this game that I think is, if you can get a copy of this, uh, there's like 40 bucks I've seen it. Um, and that's uh, great, great minis and everything else. It's called Path of Light and Shadow, my number one. So my number one, I have another controversial pick here, but uh, hear me out, hear me out. If you've played Robinson Crusoe, all right, you've basically played this game. You know how to play it. And the rule book, I know a lot of people have complained about, but it's the same game structure, game mechanisms, and formula as Robinson Crusoe. But Robinson Crusoe is highly, highly rated, whereas First Martians, Adventures on the Red Planet, mm -hmm. is very much hated for some reason. So early on, it had some bad reviews, which basically kind of killed its momentum, which mm -hmm. is really a shame because once you get past you know, the rules and understand the game, and once you see that it's basically a retheme of Robinson Crusoe, um, it's really not difficult to play. It's a great co-op game. Now, it's not necessarily the best game to play on my list as far as just, you know, is it a great game? Yes, it's a good game. It may not be perfect, but it is a good game and it is worth playing. And that's where I think it's, it's completely underrated because it should be in more people's collection. 
Um, so essentially, it replaces Robinson Crusoe's uh, uh, event deck and the adventure deck and all the cards that you would have to randomize and draw when those things happen with an app. So instead of those, you use the app and you just push a button and it gives you the random thing that happens. Um, and for some reason, that seems to be a big problem for people. Mm. And as far as exploration, you always start from the center of the uh, the planet where your hub is. And then you you know kind of count how many moves that you're making. And that's the extra cost that you need to move. And so you count that cost in pawns. And just like Robinson Crusoe, you stack pawns to do an action over you know the various areas that can do actions and everything's very you know straightforward as to what it does it'll say if you go here you can heal a wound here you can you know decrease the stress of the overall you know mm -hmm. social uh situation in the hub so it, it, it just baffled me that you know either a people you know weren't unable to understand the rules or b they weren't really seeing how similar it was to robinson crusoe and mm -hmm. so to me it's a really good game that you should play and pick up because i'm sure right now like uh like your copy it was it's yeah, it's pretty cheap, cheap at this it's point it's really cheap yeah um, um yeah and i'm sur i'm surprised at that too because um it is app driven because mm -hmm. I, that's one of the things with robinson crusoe that i, I would think it would really benefit from an app because you absolutely. wouldn't have to do all that bookkeeping absolutely but um hmm, interesting and, and so, it's same designer and yeah same designer and if of course you like if you prefer the sci-fi mm -hmm. and space theme then first martians is for you you know mm -hmm. if, if you prefer the the um you know lost on a on an empty island theme the robinson crusoe then you know stick with that mm -hmm. but essentially they're they're the same experience and how they play yeah well i'm you convinced me i'm going to actually try this one excellent and i look forward to uh to playing with you and i, and I cool. hope that you know hope you give it a chance yeah i'll give it a shot well that's all for our top 10 underrated games so thanks for tuning in and checking out our episode two uh this has been jared and i'm jake I'll see you guys next time. Catch you later.